So it is really good to be with you. Actually, Richie has asked me to speak on the Holy Spirit. Um, I just It seems the last couple of years, you did, didn't you? Yeah. The last couple of years, it's just been a whole... Um, I just People are re, rethinking some things, rediscovering this person of the Holy Spirit. And more than that, actually, it's, it's like Max was sharing sort of early on, that all of a sudden those promptings that the Spirit wants us to live by. These are, this is not meant to be isolated things, but it's, it's something which you, 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 you get to live by. That's happening more and more and more and more and more. And as Steve Oliver, the word that has come to him about a new era, it's a new era of the Spirit. It's interesting, I was reading a tweet, I can't remember if it was by, but somebody quite, quite um, well known in that circle, he said, he said this Easter, more out and out atheists have been saved uh, confess Christ and probably at any time for a very very long time there's something happening in our nation so, so it's a time for us to revisit some, some things that's what I want to do this morning um, just a verse I didn't have a verse and it was really during the worship um, but um, when, when Peter is preaching just after Pentecost and he's, he's, he's saying in chapter 3, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. And then this little phrase that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. He anticipated right back then that from now on, one of the things that God is going to do continually and continually when people are open to it is that times of refreshing will come upon them. <clears throat> If you're anything of a student of church history, you will know that the most neglected person of the Trinity has been the Holy Spirit. Um, when the Nicene Creed was put together in 325, it was after Constantine, supposedly the first Christian emperor. So I think I'll find out that whether that's true or not, probably before most of you. Um, but it's one of those things that is still debated because character-wise he wasn't the nicest guy in the world. <clears throat> but he called a council together in a place called Nicaea because there was all sorts of disunity within the church, not least of all concerning the person of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when they put the Nicaean Creed together, and some of you, if you were good Anglicans at one time, as Sue and I were, well, I don't know about good ones, but we were there. Um, <laughs> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, born of a virgin. Man. You know that one? Then right at the end it says, and in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so he's tacked on the end, and you think, well, hold on. What do you believe about the Holy Spirit? And, you know, for 1,800 years... There was, there, there was very little authentic understanding or expression of the Holy Spirit in the church. That doesn't mean to say things didn't happen. Of course they were going to happen. But we need to ask the question, what does God want to happen? Yeah. What is it that God has called his church to do? Is it to influence? No, more than that, it's to change. And when Peter was preaching at Pentecost, he understood that. But we need times of refreshing from God in order that that can happen. And uh, as you go through church, you see, you're amazing. Hold on a minute. Um, you would be surprised to know that before, before the end of the first century, in fact, probably 20 years before the end of the first century, you know, the charismatic gifts by and large were lost to the church. That's frightening. In fact, we have the writings of somebody called Clement who actually records for us that two elders were put out of the church in Corinth for speaking in tongues. Whereas 30 years before, Paul was writing a letter to them to try and correct the fact that they were speaking in tongues more than they ought to have been in their meetings. It doesn't take long to lose what you have. And uh, there can be all sorts of reasons for that. And one of them is often the cynicism and sadly, that, that, when that gets into the church and that, uh, that nut that you were speaking about, often it is we get hurt, we get disillusioned, we get disappointed. We, can get, we, 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 we won't admit we're disappointed with God, but sometimes we're disappointed. We so longed for something and it just didn't seem to happen. And we do. It's that kernel, it's that hardness. And inside that... That, uh, that hardness. When, when, when that shell is broken, 
there's something that's very oily. And, and God spoke to me earlier this morning. And for those of you that, that at the end respond, I want to anoint you with oil. He's given me wine to make my heart rejoice, but he's given me oil to make my face shine. And that shining is the testimony of Jesus. And actually, if we don't have it, then we're not going to be very attractive to those that are perishing in the world in which, in which we live. So the church in those early centuries, they battled with heresies. And when you're battling with things, you, 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 you get a bit tight. And in so doing that, you lose the oil. You build good structures. Church got very, very uh, institutional, mid-second century battling with Gnosticism. But the person of the Holy Spirit was lost. The ministries were lost. Particularly the prophet was lost because the Gnostics were itinerant prophets, very charismatic, but denied the deity and the humanity of Christ. And so the word of God was put together. The canon of the scripture came in. The creeds came in. All good things came in, but with it came what we would call the one man ministry. But hear the bishop and you hear God. Well, that, that, there's some truth in that. But it's not just the bishop or the pastor who speaks. There's the apostle, there's the prophet, there's the evangelist, there's the teacher. There is the body who speaks. And when you lose that, you lose the oil. And God wants those times of refreshings to be upon us. And Whilst, the, whilst there have been moves of God right through those 1800 years, of course there's always people that want an authentic expression of, of faith. Nevertheless, by and large, the Orthodox Church has not received it. They've even developed theologies as to why we don't receive it. But there was a defining moment which I want to share with you. Max, Max has sat in, a, he's been leading worship when I've been doing this stuff so many times. And he, he's, he's, he, he, he's something, oh, not Topeka again. <laughs> How many of you have heard of what happened in Topeka in 1901? <laughs> Max has heard. Now let me tell you, you won't find this in most of the church history books. You won't find it there. Why? Because they don't want to acknowledge it. Don't want to acknowledge it. It's interesting, uh, we were, when we were in Wrexham, they had a, a, they had a wonderful book sh um, store there, and I bought some books, had some super stuff. Then they had defining moments in church history. And I thought, I'm just going to see if Topeka's there, or a Sousa Street said, no, totally ignored. Like Toronto will be ignored, and a lot of the other books where they're written up. Why? Because we don't want to face, the, the, really, the challenges of that. Because once you go there, you say, oh my goodness, there's more and again that's that's why that conference yesterday was super there's more this defining moment 1901 a guy called Charles Parham who had been sickly as a child nearly died and uh, 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 godly parents he promised God as a very young man you a young child actually on his but they didn't think he would survive that he would serve God if he spared him. And God did. Later he went to college, but he went to an ultra-Calvinistic college, and it wasn't, the, wasn't, the, wasn't the, Cal, the stuff that Calvin actually taught. It was beyond that. And he just got disillusioned with the whole thing. And then he went and uh, studied to be, become a medical doctor. And again, God dealt with him. And again, he came back to God and said, I will, I will serve you. Um, and uh, one of the things that he did, he, he bought this big old place called, I think it was called Folly's End or something like that, something for, something Stone's Folly, that was right. And he, he loved to, to teach and to train, to disciple. And he would have 40 students um, each year. And he'd give them a year, it was basic stuff. He had a real emphasis on healing because of his own, because of his own healing and he got faith for that. And he would... Um, 20, 20 men, 20 girls. This is the days of the prairie still. Um, pretty primitive and they would be in the bunk houses out the back. And he would often leave them something to study and then go away for a few days. And on one occasion he said, I want you to study the, the Acts of the Apostles. And I want you to study in relation to the, the baptism or the filling or the receiving of the Spirit. Because all sorts of terminology is used there. And I want you to study. And when, when I come back, I want you to tell me what you, th what you think. 
And he gathered them after several days and they said, well, it seems to us that when we've gone through these, these, these records of the Spirit coming upon various groups of people, which we'll look at very briefly a little bit later, they, they seemed to, it, one thing that seemed to be was that speaking in tongues seemed to always be present. And that's a phenomenon we don't really know anything about today. And there was a young woman who's becoming quite famous whose name is Agnes Osman. And she said, I want you to pray for me. I, I want the filling with the Holy Spirit, just like those early Christians did. And he, 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 he recalled to later that as he put his hand upon her head, it was as though, almost, almost like a mantle. It was something that came upon her. It was visible. And she began to speak in tongues. She spoke in the Chinese language and she couldn't speak anything else for three days. Actually, I'm not sure I would want that experience. My wife might like it for me. But when you think about it, it's scary. Now, why don't you find that in the church history books? Well, I'll tell you what also you don't find is that the other 39 students said, you pray for us as well. Every one of them spoke known languages. And they took that as a sign they should go to those nations and become missionaries. Whether they got it right or not, they didn't do anybody any harm. And that's exactly what they did. There was a, there was a guy there that uh, the, the mantle seemed to pass from Parham to a black guy, a black pastor called William J. Seymour. And William J. Seymour, because of the segregation laws, he was not allowed to be with the white people. But he wanted to receive the ministry, so he used to he cut out a cardboard box, he put eyes and mouth, and he sat. That's, like, that's humility, isn't it? That is humility. And the mantle of God came upon him, and he went down to Los Angeles, and he began to minister in the Scottish quarter there, in a place called Bonnie Bray Street. And, and, and the porch became really a pulpit. And it says sometimes, wow, you couldn't, you, it was so much noise as the Spirit of God came on people. Other times, you could have heard a pin drop. Such was the presence of God upon them. And they needed somewhere to meet and they, they found this old um, Methodist chapel that had been d partly destroyed by fire, just being used now for storage in a place called Azusa Street. And of course, it's the, that was the beginning of the great Azusa Street revival. Smith Wigglesworth, all, all those Pentecostal healers came out of that. And it was the beginning. Now, I think... It's the only time recorded in church history that I've been able to find that the same event took place 1800 years later as took place at Pentecost, known languages. What was God doing? Folks, he was making a point. God loves to make a point. There are defining moments. What happened to Parham? Uh, if I'd been a minister in the next town, I would have said, Parham, you've got to come to my church. I need some of this. They didn't, they drove him out of town. He got a tent and he went on crusades and he died in 1927. They reckon more than two million people came to Christ under his ministry and, 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 and the tent was just filled with, with crutches and wheelchairs of people who have been amazing, amazingly healed. Hey, folks, doesn't this just warm the cockles of your heart? Yeah, read Reinhard Bonnke's. Have you read it? Wow, 700 pages, you can't put it down. You know, so God is, God, God is still going to bring that anointing on some. But folks, he wants to anoint the body. Yeah. It's the body he wants. He's the head, we're the body. He gives directions to his body. And so that was a defining moment in church history. And, and really, that's where we've been part of if you like, that movement, tradition, call it what you like, the charismatic Pope, stroke Pentecostal, stroke restoration. People give all sorts of names to things, but these are these times of refreshing which have been, God keeps bringing over this last 120 years and he wants more and more and more of that. The question is, do we? I, I don't know about you, I, I'm, I'm a young guy compared to Terry, I'm only 76. <laughs> but, I, I, I'm, I'm satisfied, but I want more. I'm, I've, been fe I've been feasting, but I'm hungry. Is that where you are? Yeah. If you're not, then God wants to stir us. So that conference yesterday was so, was so good. 
I was thinking when I'm preparing this this morning I, I did three sessions on the Holy Spirit when we went to Greece and I got Sue to share with me in one of the sessions of her experience of this hunger for God and I was thinking of asking her to speak this morning I thought well I'm not sure if we're going to have time because at a conference you've got time no one's going anywhere um, and, and uh, then Raina this morning said Sue I'm so blessed would you like to hear my wife I want her to share her experience of a time of refreshing. You can put whatever, you can put whatever name you like to it, but yeah, I was reading this morning in a, a psalm, meditating over just a little phrase that says, taste and see how good God is. Now what does that mean? It means God wants us to experience him. He wants us to know him, experience him. So Sue, come on up and share, okay? And if you steal the platform, that's fine. <laughs> Getting used to it. Um, just to explain, I've got to, to start again. To explain the Holy Spirit bit, I've got to bring some testimony, so I'll whiz through testimony. Um, I was a Christian um, through my teenage years, and then Ray and I married. Um, I had four kids. And Ray was a lawyer, so money was okay. Then we went to Biggin Hill. Um, he became the full time. Oh, it's Chris and Rosie. Sorry, I've just seen you there. <laughs> <laughs> and we went to Biggin Hill. Um, the church was very small, and finances dipped quite dramatically when Ray left the law and became the full time leader of the church. And it was flipping hard work. <laughs> We'd got very little cash um, and four kids. Um, unfortunately, it was during the era when automatic washing machines came into existence, which really was a blessing. Um, and so to get some extra cash, and John Burr reminded me that back in those days, I used to take in washing because we were blessed to have a washing machine. And uh, Eric Bryant, I think maybe you might have known Eric Bryant, they, him and John Burr were uh, young men at the time, and so I used to do their washing for them, and lots of little things, you know, make all the kids clothes and get some hags, and it was hard work. And during that time, although my faith in Jesus was as strong as it has ever been, and I never ever thought that God didn't love me, I never ever thought... Any, any kinds of those all poor me type of attitude because I loved being a Christian and all those years I was very fulfilled in what I was doing. I loved being a mum, I loved doing all that work and that kind of stuff. Um, but obviously as time went on, kids grew and a um, bit more spare time because during that time I found fitting in Bible reading um, was ex and spending time with God was extremely difficult. There's one thing you can do. You could do boring old ironing at the same time as praying. So boring old ironing became something quite special to me. Um, but then as time went on um, and I had a little bit more time to myself, I started getting um, a real dissatisfaction um, with my relationship with God. I wanted what Ray was saying. I wanted more. And that coincided with, um, I don't know if many of you knew of what happened down into, out in Toronto in Canada, um, wonderful move of the Holy Spirit. And it came across to England, people went across and uh, to Toronto and got wonderfully blessed and touched by the Holy Spirit. And so it came back and, I mean, those of you possibly might be as old as us, um, we had meetings called the fire meetings um, people were sharing testimony and the Holy Spirit was coming and it was just wonderful um, and it was during that time when I started getting this real desire for the Holy Spirit because he although I knew he was with me because I couldn't have had this relationship with God that I had it didn't have time in my life to be sort of kind of obvious um, and I wanted, and I wanted that. And it was during those times when Sheila, bless her heart, had received from God very dramatically and received for the Holy Spirit in a wonderful way. So Sheila, I said, I, I 
would go to these fire meetings and want prayer and you know they said if you want prayer put your hands up and worship God and we'll come and pray with you and that happened to me and I did it so often I'd be up the front and I'd been prayed for and nothing happened <laughs> and so I went to Sheila and I said Sheila you've got to help me I was getting a bit fed up with the whole thing it was leaving me behind because lots of people were moving on in God and I felt I wasn't so Sheila bless her heart I used to go over and visit her very regularly she used to pray with me she'd check me out check that there wasn't some hidden sin or anything like that that was stopping God blessing me and then she'd phone me up and said you know what have you read in the Bible today and she just just was a wonderful friend during that time and this went on for about nine months and you know you just think oh god but that desire was still there and i just kept on and on and on i mean to a certain extent i mean by my character i had to bring a bit of humor into the whole thing because otherwise i'd be discouraged completely and i remember going to these fire meetings where the holy spirit was moving on so many people and i'd sidle up to somebody who was obviously <laughs> receiving the holy spirit and so, sort of, Lord, miss him or miss her and get me. So, you know, you just had to, you know, keep lighthearted about it and not get too miserable and depressed. And then um, they used to work a lot in Mexico and some Mexicans had come across and visited us and were staying with us at the church in Biggin Hill. And just before they were going home, we decided we could have a prayer meeting um, I don't know if you were there. I expect you were. This is Chris and Rosie. I'm talking to, sorry. I <laughs> keep seeing them. Um, anyway, I just thought, well, I must go and pray. The children, as I said, were older and they were babysitting for each other and that kind of stuff. So everything was fine. And, uh, and so we were praying for the Mexicans and it was just a wonderful time of worship on a Sunday night, praying for these Mexicans as they were going back home. And all of a sudden... <laughs> sorry I can't help but get emotional about this the Holy Spirit hit me I, I it was just, just he's a he he's not an it he's a he and he came down and he hit me I was splastered to the floor it was just wonderful and I felt this power of God on me that I had been searching for I'd you know just through Bible classes and Sunday school and all that stuff. I knew, and reading the Bible, I knew about this powerful God, this one who all the walls of Jericho went down, the one who brought fire from heaven to get rid of all the baddies. And, you know, there was it's just during, and then you met about Jesus and he just calmed the wind and calmed the waves. A powerful, powerful God. And I'd never experienced it. I did that night. It was fabulous. I was rolling around the floor. I was laughing. And then I'd suddenly remember I was meant to be praying for the Mexicans. <laughs> so I, I was down there. And I found a man with trousers. Fortunately, he'd got them with a belt. And I'd climb up his trousers. <laughs> like trying to get up to pray for these Mexicans. And now I was back down again. And... It lasted for three days. It was just fabulous, just fabulous. I'd try and do normal householdy things, and I'd go up to, I can remember going up to Safeways, which was in Biggin Hill, and I'd grab my trolley, and in I'd go, and then I'd bump into somebody, Carol Gillard from the church of Biggin Hill, or, or somebody, and the Holy Spirit came on me again. I, I could not have cared less. And I mean... I mean, I'm not that type of person. I am a bit now. I'm a bit more extrovertish, I suppose. But I wasn't in those days. But the knack from that after those three days, the knack afterwards was to keep that relationship with God, the relationship with Jesus, and the relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's fairly easy, like Ray said, to let him drift away in a way. Um, but... He never actually goes. He's always there, and it's ever so easy to say, Holy Spirit, come back again. I need you like that. And he just stirs that back up again in you. Mm. Very good. Super. That's okay. 
did have some glasses somewhere. All right. Well, as they say, follow that. That's a... <laughs> She's knocking the water over now. It wasn't long after that we went, and, uh, went up to Scotland and did a little Holy Spirit conference. I have to say, they had several speakers and they were all naff. So no one turned up for me. Uh, <laughs> that's true, wasn't it? They didn't blink and turn up. There's only about 30 of them. They, they, it was, but somebody phoned and said they'd heard we'd had a good conference. It was there any chance that I could go and speak to them on the Sunday night? And we went down. Oh, we went. We were on oh, the sky. Went down to this place. There were nine people there, and uh, Duncan Campbell's grandson was actually the minister. Uh, he's a revivalist. And, uh, and they're, they're Presbyterian, they wanted me to do the whole service, so I can't do that. Now, I'll just preach at the end. And uh, I, I shared out of Acts 18, I remember what it was. But the thing is, Sue said to me, it's, it's happening again! <laughs> I said, well, just lay hands on them, Sue. And, and, they, they, and they sat for the whole meeting, and they just, we just left them, they were out. Folks, it, you know, it, it, it's weird sometimes. But it's times refreshing. And they, they may not last forever in that, but there's so many of them. Um, Wesley and Whitfield, they knew that. They probably didn't speak in tongues. That's not, the, that's not particularly the issue. That's not what we're, that's not what we're on about this morning. Um, I used to work with a church in Texas. Some of you know my friend Keith Rushing. Do you remember him? He's... Um, uh, good golfer we planted a church with him in a place called Las Cruces in New Mexico and Trevor and I were coming back from Mexico and Trevor Payne had again a very strange anointing Um, we'd go into a meeting and people would fall over by just Trevor walking in now now I I got cheesed off with that in the end (laughs) because I couldn't preach and I thought I want them to receive what God has got for them, but I'd like them to hear what it is before they get it. (laughs) Because, you know, I'm absolutely serious. So, Trevor's a humble guy. I'd leave him outside. (laughs) I'd do the preaching and then let him come in and do the stuff. I tell you what, I don't know about you, have you ever felt a little bit, you know, well, he'd lay hands on people and they'd go boing, 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 boing. And I'd lay hands and I'd think, for goodness sake, fall over, do something. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever had that experience? No, don't worry about it. It's, 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 God who, it's God who does things with us. We, you know, we've got to understand that. And it was marvellous. So Trevor and I, we've come back from, we've come back from Mexico and we're visiting our friend um, with this new church plant up in a uh, place called Las Cruces. It's the cross, the place of the cross. That's what it means. And, um, uh, and, and, we pray, and, and the Spirit of God just comes on this church. and It was just wonderful. And then I got a request, please don't ever go again. They said, and these were our friends. This was part of a movement, our friends. And I said, why? They said, because we can't handle it. We haven't got anybody who can handle it. I said, well, you don't have to handle it. But, and, but that was really sad. Now, I went back there 20 years, I went back there 20 years later, which was about three years ago. I happened to be in the area in Phoenix and we were driving, driving through and we stopped. And the young pastor of the church, um, whose um, um, his parents I know very well, he said, I want you to preach on the Holy Spirit. I said, well, what are you now? Are you charismatic or what? Because you always were. He said, well, we're continualists. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I said, what does that mean? Well, so Wayne Gruden came up with that. We believe the gifts continue. I said, okay, when did you last have tongues in interpretation? Not since you were here 20 years ago. I said, then you've continued in nothing. Now, that is very, very sad, but it begs us to ask the question before we judge others, <laughs> is it possible that that, that could be the situation in our churches because see we sing the songs charismatic worship is not singing lively songs charismatic worship is engaging in all the gifts that God has given us so that we are an edifying body that's been refreshing being here this morning it's been lovely because we've been edified right from the beginning we Max was so was so biblical 
How do you start a meeting? With good news. It brings, it brings healing to the bones. Almost wasn't good news, was it, Max? If you had, we hadn't got to the end, we're in trouble. Oh. But do you hear what I'm saying? Now, somebody said to me recently, well, how would, you've been in ministry for 40 years. How would you, what would you say in those 40 years you were trying to do? Which is a good question to have to think about. I said, and this is the answer. I said, I think what I've longed for is to see a, a, a genuine expression of New Testament um, faith and church in the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and so when you go through, when you go through the scriptures, you, you find there that basically there are five accounts of the Holy Spirit coming. And I'm going to go through very, very quickly because I want to get to the end. I've got some oil because I want, I want someone and, you know, and anoint some people if that's what you want. OK, Pentecost. You know, we all know that, don't we? The Spirit of God comes. The promise of the Father comes. They long for that. Right through the Old Testament, there's only a few anointed people. There's prophets, priests and kings. There's, you go to the judges and you've got people like Samson. Yeah, you've got some real, real strange people. But you know what? The Spirit doesn't remain on them. They lose the Spirit. Why? Through their sin, their disobedience. It says that Je when the Spirit came on Jesus, it said it remained on him. And when it comes on his body, it remains on his body. Even when we're going through bad times, even when we're in sin. The Spirit remains on us, but that Spirit will convict us and bring us back. As Cheryl Coates used to say, you can't play around with God for too long. It's you submit or you get purged in the end. And that's why I don't like the word backslidden. Because it's almost as though that's a, a, an acceptable condition. No, it's not an acceptable condition. It means you're a nullified member of the body of Christ. You've been neutralised. So what happens at Pentecost? At Pentecost, Peter preaches. They're cut to the heart. They repent. They're baptised in water. The Spirit of God comes on them. Baptised in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, received the Spirit. This is terminology. And, and the writers use this same term in different Different ways it doesn't matter we don't want to get too forensic with terminology but we do want to taste and see how God is good he is we want to experience God because when we experience God then we move out of experience and that's so so important so a Pentecost and 3,000 are saved then it's a mighty move of God it kicks the whole thing off and then you've got Samaria with Philip Philip was a deacon he was serving at tables but he's got an anointing on him. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Goes up to Samaria. Not a pleasant place to go. The Samaritans are the age-old enemies of, of the Jews. They don't love one another. But he goes there and he uses his evangelistic gift. There's signs and wonders. There's healings. Amazing deliverance. People are sh shrieking as demons come out of them. They're baptised. In water but the Spirit doesn't fall on them doesn't baptize them doesn't fill them whatever term you want to use so Peter and John go up there and they then tidy up if you like and that's what's been happening since the 60s in this country we've been tidying up so we get the authentic the whole package of what God wants us to have because if we don't have it, we're not going to get the job done. And so, you know, even Simon, he sees what happens when Peter and John go, blah, I need some of this. I'd love to be able to do that. And he offers them money. Now, it was out of order, but at least he saw something. Some of us, or some in the church, don't want to see it, even deny it's possible or attribute it to other forces, dark forces. And then we got Paul's conversion. That Damascus Road account. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you read, if you are a reader, you must read Tom Wright's book, Paul and a, a Biography. It is amazing. Anything from Tom Wright is good, but this is particularly, it's, you can get it for about 13, 14 pounds hardback. It is amazing. Read it. I'm devouring it at the moment. But, you know, he opens up particularly on Paul, his conversion. <sighs> Conversion's not even the right word. It's his meeting with this. He knew he was meeting with God. 
And then the surprise, surprise, this God, his name is Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified one. Oh, so what does he do? Well, Ananias gets this vision of, of this man, uh, Paul or Saul of Tarsus. He goes, and what does he do? He, he, he heals him. He baptizes him and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Doesn't say he speaks in tongues, by the way. That's a 20th century phenomena of that. It doesn't matter. But he doesn't say he speaks in tongues. Although Paul later says, I'm glad I speak in tongues more than any of you. So we, we don't want to put conditions on these things. We want it to be authentic and let God give what he wants to give. All right? That's, that's so important. Otherwise, we put pressure on people. They feel, oh, I didn't get the real deal. When the Spirit comes, who'll get the real deal? So, so, you know, Paul there, there's no tongues mentioned, but, he, but later he says, Cornelius' house. I think it's hilarious. I think Cornelius, you read the whole thing. I mean, Peter is in the, in, he's in the house of someone called Simon the Tanner. Dead skins. Jews don't go near dead things. So Peter's sort of somewhere on a journey, isn't he? And, and God takes us on journeys. He wants to deal with our prejudices and our uh, fads and all this thing. And, 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 so he's, and then he has this, this, these three guys turn up and he goes off with them, goes off to, um, goes off to Cornelius' house. And he must think, blow me, I'm in trouble being here. I shouldn't be here in the first place. What the guys from Jerusalem with James's obos are going to say. And, you know, and, and, and he begins to preach the gospel. As he's preaching, they start speaking in tongues. The Spirit of God comes on them. You ever had that experience? I've had it once in China. Once in China, sharing with a Chinese girl about the Holy Spirit with Dave and Sue White. They asked me, we get there getting dinner, just share a bit on the Holy Spirit. She starts speaking in Chinese. I said, Dave, I don't understand a word of what you're saying. He comes in, no, she's speaking in tongues, Ray. Oh, wish it happened like that every time. Up here, we've got a problem, haven't we, with it here. But, hey, so poor Peter, then what does he do? He then baptises them in water. I don't know if he made an appeal of hands up for Jesus. I don't believe in that stuff anyway. But they were saved. And are you getting them? You're getting what I'm with the drip. There's a package here. There's a package in the New Testament here. It may not always work out the same way. It's a little bit different. Some of it can be a bit confusing. But, but Paul here in, in Ephesus, I think this is the pinnacle of his ministry, which we can learn so much from. We haven't got time to, to dig in. But when he arrives back, in Ephesus, having been there previously and done well in the synagogue previously, he, he meets with, he says, 12 men. I think it's 12 head of families, probably about 50 people, probably the, the fruit of Aquila, Priscilla and Apollos' ministry. And he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? No, he knows they didn't receive the Holy Spirit. It's, 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 it's because he, he knows what a spirit-filled people look like. And they say... Well, we're ignorant about the Holy Spirit. You might think, oh, well, they couldn't have been saved then. <laughs> Luke describes them as disciples. <laughs> I was just ignorant like that about the Holy Spirit. You could have said that to me in 1966 when Sue and I lived in Mossley Road in Penge. And then I went to a meeting, didn't we? And we saw it. We saw it. We saw. What? We ran away. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Frightened frightened the life out of us but you know what we wanted what frightened the life out of us and the Holy Spirit fell on me particularly in 1966 in number 25 Mossley Road upstairs fortunately our neighbours downstairs were away <laughs> and it lasted all night and uh, and there were some people living in Penge that I was getting them up in the middle of the night to tell them what was happening to me. Sadly, the vicar said, it's all right, but don't, don't go, we don't want everybody getting that, do we? Well, well, we do want everybody getting that. That's the whole point, we do. We want spirit-filled bodies of non-religious people who live in the world and not in, the, in meetings. <laughs> but, so Paul, he... 
He lays his hands on them. The Spirit comes on them. Then for some reason or other, which I don't know why, he baptises them again. I don't know why, but it doesn't really matter. It may, maybe he got it wrong. It doesn't matter. He felt it was right to do it. There are gonna, we, we, we want to tick all the boxes. We, wanna, we, wanna, we want to know God. We want to know him. We want to know the power of his spirit. Why? Not because it makes us feel good, although it does. It's because we've got a job to do. We are co-workers with him in changing this world. There's no higher privilege. When people say, well, we got saved to get our sins forgiven, we did not get saved to get our sins forgiven. We got our sins forgiven, but that wasn't why we got saved. We got saved to change this world for him, because it belongs to him. It's in his inheritance, and we have the privilege of going and getting it back for him. That's why we're so excited in Regions Beyond, because we're on six continents now. It's not that we're saying, wow, we've got now 300 churches, for whatever. And I'm so glad you had that time with Terry. He's an amazing. We were down with him just before Christmas. I had five hours with him early morning. He's the sort of guy you can spend five hours praying with. Why? Because he brings the presence of God. You can't buy that. And that's what God is wanting us to to, to, to experience a Paul is there in Ephesus. So he asked that question, did you receive the Holy Spirit? He knew they didn't. The Spirit comes upon them. Why was it so important that that should happen? See, I think sometimes we look at, we, we look at Paul, we, we, we look at the big boys and the big girls, don't we? And we think, wow, we're looking at the wrong people. If we should be looking anywhere, we should be looking at the body. You see, Paul, the great apostle that he was, and he was, he was a giant. And he suffered much for Jesus. <laughs> you know, people talk about apostles and something like that. I say, well, when I read my, my Bible, they're the off-scouring. <laughs> they're not at home very often. And they get beaten up a lot. And sometimes they get shipwrecked. So, you want to be an apostle? Well, you know, there you go. But, but, but as great as he was, what did he know he couldn't do? He couldn't do it on his own. He needed a spirit-filled people. People who are operating in the gifts of the spirit, not just in meetings. When we operate in meetings, you see, with the gifts of the spirit, we edify one another, we build one another up. Why? So that we can go out into the world. And so we can do something in the world. We can do something where we work, some, where, we, where we exercise, where we play. You know, where we, where we study, where we meet people. That's, that's, what it's, that's what it's all about. That's what Jesus did. He didn't spend a lot of time in meetings. Yeah. He, he spent time out there. And he, he didn't know any more than you do every day who he's going to meet. He didn't know he's... The father said, well, all right, you better go to St Mary. You'll get tired and you'll get, you'll get hungry. Send the boys out to get some pizza. And you're going to meet this woman. By the way, she's a bit of a naughty woman. He didn't know that. We've got to understand that. We are to walk, says John, even as he walked. How did he do that? It was through the Spirit. He submitted himself to humanity, even though he was God, and he was led by the third person of the Trinity. If he wasn't, then there's no hope for us, because he's our, he's our model in that sense. We had to be even as he is. And when the Spirit came at Pentecost, that was now to be, that is now the role of his people to be even as he was all that Jesus began to do and teach through the Holy Spirit Ephesus was was the center of idolatry and occult power in the, in, 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 in in that part of the world it was a it was an amazing place you just you, I haven't got time to give you a description but it, it was foul it was foul and God sent him God sent Paul to Ephesus to begin to shake it up um, and to change that centre to be something else. And he knew he needed a spirit-filled body. Within two and a quarter years, that's all it is, we, we rounded up to three, but it's two and a quarter years, he leaves the church confident that the elders that he's raised up will continue the work that he's began. For him, it's mission accomplished. He, he says to them, after I go there's going to be some issues. Um, there, there are those that are going to come in 
into this church and they're going to take you on. They wouldn't take me on, but they've misunderstood the issue, you see. It's not me, it's Jesus in me, and you've got the same Jesus in you. I've trained you well, you'll do well. And there's others in your own church who've got their own agendas. Every church has got that. And you will deal with them as well. And that church in Ephesus, it survived. It did well, it changed that city. And by the time Paul leaves, this is what you've got there. <laughs> you, you've got there, you've, you've got large numbers of converts. We don't know how many. But if, you, if, if there's going to be a riot in Penge because, of the, the, because this church is turning the place upside down, I think it means there's probably going to be thousands of people. Yeah. I think. You don't have riots for a, you know, a nice charismatic church. But you do have riots when you have the sort of stuff that took place in Ephesus. Okay? So the, the city is, is turning. To, you know, people are going out of business because Uckhole is turning to Jesus. The school of Tyranus is where he sets it up. From, we, we know it's from 11 till 4 in the afternoon, marginal note, one of the old texts. 11 till 4, when everybody else was having a sleep, they, he was training and we know that the whole of the Roman province of Asia received the word of God. Churches were planted in that time. How amazing. He writes a letter to that group of churches six years later. We call it the book of Ephesians. It was, probably wasn't called that originally. That was a, that we, it got changed a bit. But it basically it was a round robin to all those churches. And one of the things he says in chapter 5 is this. He says, don't get filled with, don't get drunk with wine because that leads to all sorts of other things. Rather, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to one another, Psalms him. He says, be filled. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the present continuous. In other words, be continually filled. <laughs> Paul is frustrating, isn't he? Because he doesn't tell you how. <laughs> Why? He didn't need to because they knew how. They lived with him for two and a quarter years. So I've had to figure that one out for myself. This is the way I figure it out. I can't say I may have it all right, but it works for me. I wake up in the morning, I'm, I'm an early riser. I love spending a couple of hours. I know not all you can do that, you've got to go and do a real job. You've got to get on a train. But that's what I do. And when I wake up in the morning, and I, they're having my devotional times, I wake up and I, my assumption is this, I'm a child of God, all those things we confessed. And I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes she'll sound a bit grumpy in the morning. I don't believe that. <laughs> she just may be right. But it doesn't matter. I can be grumpy and filled with the Holy Spirit. Because what I do, I begin to worship God. And the Spirit kicks in. So I, I believe I am filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I use tongues a lot. If you, if you speak in tongues, oh, speak in tongues. It's so edifying. I'm a bit cheeky. Most meetings I go to now, I do speak in tongues publicly, just to gauge where they are and see it. And, oh, well, I had a bad experience in Bromley after I'd not been there for three months because of this knee. I got, oh, it was such a dead meeting. This is Trevor. Trevor wasn't there. Daniel wasn't there. Oh, I was so dead. And I think, I've been, there for, I've been away for three months and I was so looking forward. I should have come to Penn, shouldn't I? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, in the end, I just, baba so yeah, so. And anyway, I went for it. And then no one interpreted. That is embarrassing, isn't it? So I had to interpret it. Then I sat down. I thought, Ray Lowe, you, you haven't been here for three months. You've come. You're judging them. All the rest. I felt really bad. Went home very condemned. Until I got two phone calls to say three people came to Christ because of that time. I never understood what Paul meant when he said tongues are for unbelievers. I still don't understand, but anyway, they got saved, so that's good. So there you go. Speaking tongues, people might get saved. We're preaching the gospel, isn't it? So he writes this. So you, you believe you're filled with the Spirit. Use tongues. Do you think you can lose your salvation? You sure? Yeah, I think I am as well. But I'll tell you what you can do. You can be neutralised. You can be neutralised. And I think a lot of the body of Christ is neutralised. Because they're mucking about. They're mucking about with sin. Guys, I want to tell you, the whole sexual thing is the biggie that will neutralise you. Do you know why? You can't serve God 
and be messing around with pornography or whatever you're messing around with. You can't do it. It's a, and you know, and we, we, we <laughs> I was uh, 12 years ago, I was in Missoula, which is in Montana, which is actually in America. And it was at a funeral of my friend who was leading the church there. And uh, they put me up in a very nice hotel. It was a, it was, um, a Hilton. And it was plush. Now, they had a lady who worked there, so she got a cheap deal, because they never would have spent that amount of money on me, I know that. It had everything. Everything was laid on, including some very naughty films. Now, I'm still hot-blooded. Don't be fooled by this body. I'm still pretty <laughs> hot-blooded. And women without their clothes on are good-looking ones. There's still some appeal, believe it or not. So what do I do? I phone Sue, and I tell her. I said, I'm submitting myself to you on this because I'm going to Mexico. I cannot go to Mexico in the power of the Spirit if I've got a bad conscience. See, see, I know I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven even before it's done, aren't I? It was Calvary, but in here, it's going to be saying to me, Raylo, <laughs> you're, you're, you're not what you're cracked up to be. You think you could go down to Mexico and, take, and, and, and tear down strongholds? when you've been mucking around with that. So I told Sue, so I said, so this is what the film's on offer. I'm watching The Gladiator for the 47th time. I, I just love The Gladiator. <laughs> so at the end of the week, I do this all week. I'm there for a week. I pick up $500 worth of uh, telephone, a telephone bill. And one of my mates said, you're mad. I said, no, I'm not, I'm smart. I got faith for $500. I have no faith for functioning in the Holy Spirit as God has called me to be to change things when I'm mucking about with filth. Now this is, this is sobering stuff, ladies and gentlemen. One of the theories I have, the reason why women contribute much more than men in meetings, because there's a lot of men in meetings who've got a bad conscience. Now, if, you, if that's you, if that's a word of knowledge for you, clean your act up. You'll get to glory, but you won't like it when you get there, first of all because there's going to be a wiping away of tears and there may be this this is the life that we got we only got one life we will soon be past only what's done for Jesus will last that was CT stud so ladies and gentlemen we we need the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit and his gifts are not just for meetings they are for us in the world so as as Max started it off so wonderfully for us. We need to be sensitive to the promptings of the Spirit. This is the way that God wants us to live. You see, you can have all sorts of techniques, five spiritual laws, you can whip out your book and do all this stuff, but you know, un unless, unless you're being led in the Spirit, a lot of this stuff is just fleshy. It's you rather than being led of God. Uh, we had our Christmas dinner Oh, we have a very growing family very dysfunctional but very growing so there are people who call me granddad I don't, I, and even great granddad now and there's no blood or anything but anyway that's another story but we thought what we do for Christmas dinner so we all went to a hotel we've never done it before paid a fortune went to a hotel and it was the, the meal was terrible Terrible. We sta we were supposed to sit down at, was it two? Got there about four. We didn't, oh, okay, anyway. By seven o'clock, most of us were, were going and we hadn't, we hadn't had the, the dinner. It was awful. So my, but my youngest daughter, who doesn't suffer fools gladly and writes very threatening letters to people, she wrote a threatening letter and put some stuff on, whatever. And um, so we were invited back. When did we have it? End of March, wasn't it? March and so we all we all come and that I mean they really did turn this the, the, you know the, all the stops out it was it was wonderful but there's a young woman called Lily I don't think I met Lily before she was she's a girlfriend of Chris who's one of my something or others <laughs> and they were talking about stuff and marriage came up and I, I talked about it. she said can you do weddings I said well, I can do anything well, I tell you what, Chris heard, and she's no longer there. He, oh, that was it. That was the last day. So <laughs> the last thing he wanted. But we just talked. She said, "Well, what do you do?" And I shared with her. And I said, "Look, just this is, is my personal story. I've written a tract. It's four pages. It's and I meet people and talk to them. I just stuck it in a bag. I said, put it in your bag. 
So I heard later that she'd gone home and her dad said, who's this guy? Who's this who wrote this? I want to meet this guy. Now, I haven't met him yet. I may never meet him, but it doesn't matter. It's that prompting of the Spirit. Um, we're having some roofing done at the moment. It's been a nightmare, six months. What's the time? Huh? What time we got to finish now? We, <laughs> ten minutes ago. I, I, okay, I'll finish. That's all right, I'll finish. I can tell you lots of stories. But listen to Max, because he's going to share again next week. And the next week, and the next week, unless you get in first. Because <laughs> yeah, this is how God wants us to be. Now, I'm going to pray for you generally now. Okay? I'm going to pray for you generally. But I've just felt God laid on my heart clearly this morning when I was uh, praying that for some of you, you need or you, you want, you're hungry. Don't come if you're not hungry. Don't come if you're not hungry, because nothing's going to happen. Mm. But God wants you to receive a refreshing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, get you going. Maybe you've never been baptised in the Holy Spirit. Well, come on. Let's just pray for you this morning, okay? And uh, I'm going to anoint you with oil, because oil is, is a symbol of God's power, presence with the Holy Spirit. He's given us wine to make our hearts rejoice, and hopefully we're going to have a glass of good wine over, over lunch. But he's given us oil to make our face shine and you know what sometimes we need to come and we need to get that that kernel of that nut cracked spirit of god do that and then we'll get the oil out we'll get the oil out. father we thank you for the gift of your son jesus we thank you father and jesus for sending the holy spirit we long for more of you father son and the holy spirit we long we long uh, to do the works that you've prepared for us before the foundation of the world. We long to see people come to a saving knowledge of you and become part of the family of God worldwide and to be doing the works that Jesus did. And so we, we thank you for this wonderful time we've had in your presence, these testimonies for what Max shared earlier on. Lord, we thank you so much. Now we pray now, Lord Jesus, will you send your spirit? Will you, will you take us out this week? And may, may we all this week, Lord, just know those promptings of your spirit and so we can share with someone or do a good work or just put someone, take someone across the road, whatever, show kindness and love just like you did, yes. Lord Jesus, that we might begin to reach out and touch people for you Jesus more and more and more and I want to pray that next week there'll be an opportunity for testimony again and give Max lots of stories Lord lots of stories because we know we blow it at times but Lord may this be a special a special uh, a moment in time for, for this church which has seen so much over 40 years but Lord there's more and we, we long to lay hold of them all now, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, you're dismissed.